Hello, this is Greg Gallison, Green Greg. It's coming to you on the 12th day of October 21. Time on deck, 0, 4, 3200 hours, Central Daylight Time. Yes, it's in the wee hours of the morning. And I'm here to bring you a warning or two or more. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. But as a proposition, my channel help you survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. So we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about volcanic activity. We're going to talk about La Palma. We're going to talk about uh, a new discovered threat from mantle plumes. Uh, that that's a little bit further down in the future, but you know it could also drive super volcanoes today and so forth. We're going to talk about uh, solar activity. The sun is due to hit us today with a solar storm. It was originally predicted to hit us yesterday, but it is slowed down. So there will be a geomagnetic storm sometime today. Uh, maybe you'll see some nice northern lights out there. And if you live in northern latitudes, you might have problems with your power grids and communications. However, this is a relatively milestone compared to what could come. So we're going to talk about these things. The sun is awakening and quaking. <laughs> the earth is a shaking. And volcanoes are threatening to either freeze us or have us a bacon. <laughs> or they might drown us with a tsunami. So we've talked previously in the video about uh, pot potentials from tsunamis some things like La Palma asteroids or La, uh, uh, the Sarbama on a torpedo called the Poseidon torpedo. The Soviets, uh, excuse me, that the Russians have now, uh, yeah, excuse me, I'm an old guy, I still call them Soviets a lot, <laughs> have uh, come up with uh, that's a horrible weapon system. It's called the Poseidon torpedo. It's got the Sarbama as its maximum uh, nuclear payload, which creates tsunamis beyond belief radioactive tsunamis to make it even worse. It could wipe out an entire coastline of the United States. So uh, these are the kind of things we're facing, not to mention stuff with China, not to mention uh, stuff internally. We have a lot of division, not to mention the economy, which is uh, shaking and quaking too right now, and food supplies, which are very much in doubt given the, uh, and just, not just food supplies, but all kinds of supplies, given the uh, current crises and supply chain uh, uh, breakdowns and unraveling. Uh, labor issues, and just a lot of stuff going on, guys, that, that threaten our economy, our well-being, things that you need to be aware of. So I, I tell everybody, keep their eyes wide open and head on a swivel, and this video is part of my eyes wide open and head on a swivel series. So again, we're going to be talking about La Palma, update on La Palma. We're going to be talking about this mantle plume, and we're going to talk about this solar storm. Okay, so if you're not subscribed to my channel, subscribe. Bang the update notification bell and click all so you'll get more updates because I bring you quite a broad range of things, including what to do if the grid should go down, how to live, how to garden, grow your own food, how to do worm farming, how to find free uh, edibles from the nature, from the weeds and the trees. I cover that kind of stuff. The problem with trying to forage from the weeds and the trees and even your garden is that uh, it may have situations that crops will fail, especially if you have a nuclear or uh, a volcanic winter. Uh, you may not be growing much, so you need to grow enough to store also and uh, save seeds. But even that, especially when you're getting started, may be in inadequate. Most likely, uh, you know, there's a lot of crop failures and trial and error. So I encourage you to store as much food as you can, too. So and with that regards, right now, you can get a very good special. twenty. Uh, you can get actually $100 off a three-month supply of food that lasts 25 years. This is good stuff, guys. It is real food. It's freeze dried. It reconstitutes into the regular meals. It's not. Uh, this is not the goop you get with uh, other stuff. And my Patriot Supply still has supplies. They're not out yet. That's the cool thing about my Patriot Supply. A lot of your other uh, vendors are starting to run out because they're having supply chain issues right now. Right now, my Patriot Supply can still supply you. That's the good news. I say right now. Who knows what the supply chain breakages are going to do down the road? Get it while the getting's good. That's what I say. Go to prepwithgreg.com and you get plenty of other prep and supplies there too. And they have, my church patron supply has the widest selection of anybody out there. They still have availabilities. Their prices are still good. So it's the time to go check them out. And if you uh, go into my prepwithgreg.com, click the logo, uh, it will take you into all other kind of uh, uh, prep and supplies that's available to them and many other food choices that they have available. If you want gluten free, vegan, if you want to have uh, meat eaters, low carb, we've got those selections for you. <laughs> so check it out. Uh, all right, let's get on with our story. And we're going to do some sharing here. We're going to pick through some videos real fast. And this video will probably post later today in the afternoon because it's going to take a while to go through all the process and then chats because YouTube is afraid I might say something. You know, the robots have got me flagged. 
afraid that I might say something. So they, they, they monitor me real closely, but I, I don't go, you know, I try to abide by all the rules. I really do because <laughs> I know what they are. And, and, you know, I don't get kicked off the platform, but I need for you to know what, what we're facing today. Okay. That's why I cover this stuff. You need to understand the things that we're looking at. Here we go. Here we go, guys. This was from a couple of days ago. Now there's been major uplift in the Northern portion of the, uh, the Island of La Palma and Canary Islands. Uh, you may be aware the eruptions are ongoing right now are in this area right here along this ridge. And this ridge is also the one that has the fault, the fissure that some people think can cause this whole Southwest slope to slough off into the ocean at one time and cause a tsunami, a mega tsunami that could reach New York City, the East Coast, United States, Florida, and cause potentially great devastation. There's a lot of debate about that. I covered this in a previous video about two weeks ago in which I said, and you know, it's not, uh, you know, I wouldn't bank on it, you know, it's, it's not that likely it'll happen this time, but it's possibility and there's, uh, I showed a slew of scientific studies that went into it and how they modeled it. And it's to show that it is a credible failure. Some people say it won't happen. Uh, and other people are telling you it will happen. What I will tell you is that it could happen. Now, this particular development here raises the specter for what may or may not happen. And by the way, these islands have sloughed off in geologic times, major portions of the island, even bigger than what we're talking about here. So. Don't be surprised if something like this doesn't happen. But, uh, and let's hope it don't. Let's hope and pray that this does not materialize at this south, that this flank comes off. But the islands are chugging in this area right now and they're having earthquakes. Now, uh, a couple of nights ago, there's a channel that's called, um, let's see, I'm gonna find this guy. This guy right here, Bushcraft Bear. I like this guy. He lives there on La Palma and he does regular updates of what's going on. He's a really uh, smart guy. He's a bushcrafter, as you might guess, but he's living there uh, amongst this volcano. And not before last, he couldn't sleep for it making loud booms and noises, which would wake him up every you know few minutes. Uh, but last 24 hours, it's been quiet for him. You know, it's been really quiet. And he's saying, "Is this the calm before the storm?" He's really wondering about that and what could be the storm. Uh, this is a good guy. You should check his channel out. Subscribe. He's got a lot of views. Look, that video got 50, almost 51,000 views as when I last updated. It's probably more than that now. Bushcraft Bear, uh, being there, that volcano has really kicked his subscription level up. He's given daily coverage, sometimes a couple of videos a day. Uh, and maybe this is the source for a potential storm. When you get an uplift like this, it's 10 centimeters. Uh, you know, 10 centimeters, you know, that's about yay much, you know, it's about, about four inches. 10 centimeters is, um, Considering the area that's pushed up here, that's a lot of magma. And it could come out and cause an eruption up here at the peak of the island. This is where the peak volcano is. So and maybe it's a hot spot's moving and coming down here, but there's been historical eruptions or where old center comes down here too. So this volcano could erupt here. If it does, that's just going to up the ante for, for what's going on the island. Uh, it could cause more violent earthquakes. And it would be the earthquakes and the shakes more than anything that could dislodge this uh, this area here. There is a fissure there, and, and that fissure does suggest that this could come off, uh, but it's gonna take a lot of shaking. Uh, but, but the fact that there were uh, vents here along this ridge indicates that it has survived previous eruptions. That's why some people are not so worried about these vents causing it to fall off. But then again, some say the fissure has also opened up more recently in the last uh, you know, within the last hundred years. So it's uh, it's a big question. What's going to happen here? If this does cause a uh, tsunami, what would it look like? Now, I also went through some of the scientific papers in my last uh, video on this a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to go through the same papers. I'm just going to show you here uh, a sample talking about time frames. So, uh, by the way, buoy is in the Atlantic suspiciously seem to be down right now. So you might not see the shockwave propagation on a buoy on the Atlantic buoy, which is really strange. So you're just gonna to have to pay attention to what's going on on that island. Uh, and, and if a, a major event happens and if that Southwest slope does go off, and if you do live on the East Coast, you're gonna to have to have the wares so you'll know to get out. Now, if you're living in New York City, you need to know ahead of time, because it takes hours and hours and hours to a day, almost a day to evacuate New York City if everybody's running out. So you wanna be the first one to find out because if you look at it here, um, it's showing like uh, this H is six hours till it hits Newfoundland. 
So you can expect what, maybe another hour to New York, maybe not hour, hour and a half. You know, look guys, if you know, I hope it don't happen when you go to bed. That's what it does. You may not have much time <laughs> to react to it if you find out about it. So you might want to keep a daily check on some of these channels that are showing live casts from uh, the Canary Islands, uh, from La Palma, from a volcano uh, <clears throat> there, uh, Cumberry, uh, Hacus volcano. So let's see, uh, let's look here at uh, Florida. Uh, would get, have nine hours. Florida and Florida, you got nine hours and it's not as hard to evacuate, but you gotta go a long way to get out of Florida. As most of Florida is not that very high regards to the sea level. So Florida would not fare well under a major mega tsunami. Let's hope that the tsunami stays under 50 meters. Now that seems to be some consensus on that, but that's not a given. It may be less, it could be more, but uh, 50 meters seems to be what uh, some people are thinking would be the maximum uh, event of that. So I'm gonna close up a couple of these sites out here. I'm gonna close his down because I need more memory here available for what I'm doing, guys. Of course, as I do that, here we are. This is a live, it's a daytime over, over there already in uh, the Canary Islands. And you can see this fish I was looking at earlier and there's some really good fountains shooting way high earlier and it would go intermittent between down like this to big fountains. We might see some big fountains as we're watching here. There's a little fountain starting to spew up some more. There we go, picking up. Will it spew high? I don't know. It's, it's been off and on and hot and cold. Just kind of chugging. This is two views of it. This is a live, a live view. All you got to do is look live view La Palma and you will find some of these videos. It might be good just to glance at them every, every day. And let's assume we hear the volcano. Start the fountain up a little bit there. Now, I'm not going to watch any one channel here for long because I don't want to get a strike for doing that. It shows lava going through an industrial district, it looks like. Uh, or anything in the path of lava gets wiped out. Building size lava blocks from fall from volcano in Spain's island. Oh, so they're shooting up blocks the size of buildings. That's not good. All right, so that's another live show. So, uh, and beware of La Palma. Okay, now this storm they're telling us got delayed. This is kind of a graphic about these different things. And so what they're expecting is a G2 level storm. Now that's out of a scale of one to five, with two being five being extreme, uh, one being minor. And uh, G2 is considered moderate. Power systems, high altitude, high latitude, excuse me, power systems may experience voltage alarms. Long duration storms may cause transform damage if the storm lasts for a long time. It's just that if it just keeps cooking it, it's a short storm, you wouldn't expect this. You know, spacecraft may have to do uh, corrective actions, which could cause us some loss of signal. Uh, it could affect the drag on orbit if it expands the atmosphere, causing things to deorbit. Uh, this is probably not gonna be that long a storm, other systems. So it, it just talks about general things. All right, the extreme storm. Now, what only you look at here, the extreme storm is a G5. This is considered something to happen four times per cycle, and a cycle is defined as 11 years. So this extreme storm is something you might have to happen four times in a solar cycle. Um, excuse me? This is not the most extreme storm you could have then because the Keratin event is, is, is less frequent than this. So there should be a, about a G5, six for Keratin and about a G7 for what happened uh, back in the days of Charlemagne, 700 or so AD, far more intense uh, geomagnetic storm. Uh, so uh, yeah, they can get more intense, far more intense than what this scale shows. And a G6, as I would call it, or a Carrington level event, or even a railroad level event like happened in 1921 would be sufficient to totally fry our power grid. And it's not just the daylight side of the earth that's gonna get affected. It's, uh, it comes in over the magnetic lines of the earth and might often hit on the night side, maybe even more so, because we know the Quebec hydro event in 1989 occurred at about 2.40 something a.m. in the morning, i.e. during the night when, the, when that side of the earth was on the night and it's not facing the sun at all. And also the Carrington level, the Carrington event caused auroras of extreme magnitude 
it caused people miners to wake up in California and Colorado and start cooking breakfast thinking it was sunrise. <laughs> so yeah, if they had a grid there, their grid would have been sizzling. It was anywhere, it was far from sunrise. Uh, so I've, I've heard uh, another major prepper say that it only affect the daylight side of the earth. That's absolutely not true. <laughs> that is not true at all. It could affect the entire planet at once. It, it's hard to say where these things will hit most, just how it hits the magnetic field lines. And that's anybody's guess, my friends. That's anybody's guess. You can't predict that that well. Maybe one day we will be there and have that kind of stuff modeled. But uh, there's still a lot to learn here, guys. A lot to learn. There's a lot of variables involved in something like that. So this is talking about where you might see this storm. Uh, looks like we need to do. I have actually seen northern lights here in, in northern Alabama. Well, it took me to the ads. <laughs> hey, that's my patient supply. How about that? Uh, here we are. This talks about relative strengths of the storm, and how far south you might see them given that relative strength of the storm. So this is on KP index, and so they got so many different measures here. I have actually seen, I so say I live right here. I have seen northern lights a couple times right here. That's been several years ago, about like 10 or better. No, more than that, I guess. Probably about 15 years ago. I've seen northern lights right here. I called my friend Rob Suggs after seeing him one, one night. And I said, Rob, was there a solar storm last night? He says, uh, why do you ask? I said, well, Rob, I saw the northern lights. He said, well, as a matter of fact, there was a solar storm. <laughs> Some of you might know Rob Suggs was credited as the guy who saw a Tard's meteorite strike the moon with a telescope. So uh, if, you, if you look up Tard's on, on Wikipedia, you'll see them listed there. So he's got some fame for that. <laughs> I'm gonna shut down this, this site here because I need more memory here. And I'm fighting Zoom to do it. So hang on, so if that looks squirrely, it's because I'm moving stuff around to give myself more memory because I got some memory issues here. Space weather. <clears throat> so look here, departing sunspot explodes, misses Earth. Well, thankfully, we missed that one. That's over here. Now we got uh, 2282 just gave us the storm we got coming at us it's starting to swing around this guy 20 uh i said 20, uh, 2882 we got 2883 over here that's the one that, that's just parted out real good and fortunately we missed that one so here's how the aurora looks at the moment very intense so it's cracking up that storm is starting to come in here but it's not moved south so it's pretty heavy this hasn't moved south yet. Uh, asteroids, I always like to check asteroids, nothing coming within a lunar distance and the predict, and predictions looking ahead of us. But if you look behind, you find those kind of things because we always seem to find them when they zip past us. <laughs> All right, there's always more red in the past than in the future on this chart because we're finding them as they come past us. That's what's happening, guys. Enough of that chart. Uh, oh, let's see. This is the tsunami risk. Uh, this is a video I did. Uh, if you go back to September the 20th, if you look back, if you go to my channel and just click videos on the top, uh, you know, it, it, you get around the playlist and I can show you. If you scroll back a little bit, and you'll find my tsunami risk video here. And I'm going a lot into the papers and simulations and different things in here. I'm not going to repeat all that day. So we can close that video. All right, good. Here's the other thing I want to talk to you about today. And we're going to wrap up here. Huge, sub, a huge subterranean tree is moving magma to Earth's surface from the mantle. That's what it's talking about. Mantle magma moving uh, to Earth's surface, surface. And they found the transport mechanisms to make it happen. And they're not always a mantle plume shooting straight up, but rather these, these giant trees and blobs of mantle uh, uh, supplied uh, stuff coming up. And I think Yellowstone is the youngest uh, of the top plume type volcano, but it doesn't reach down as deep as some of these older ones. Some of these older ones are coming from the core uh, mantle interface. Apparently the 30% of the area between the core and the mantle is a super hot uh, source for uh, a lot of these other mantle plumes. Um, 
in, in Siberia, there was a huge eruption that left a large part of Siberia covered in basalt some 250 million years ago. At least that's, you know, some of you don't buy into these old timelines, but this is what we're told, okay? Uh, but Siberia had a huge volcanic uh, eruption. This believed to cause the, the, the biggest extinction on earth, the Permian extinction. Uh, which wiped out the trilobites, apparently, 250 million years ago. Uh, that was uh, worse than the death, it was the extinction of the dinosaurs in terms of die-offs. And it's believed to have been caused by one of these mantle plumes. Uh, as many of you know, there, there, there was a lot of debate about the extinction of the dinosaurs. A lot of people thought the deck and traps in India, a huge basaltic uh, upwell in India, might have done it, but it turns out the asteroid or comet that hit Earth at, uh, at uh, Yucatan Peninsula and Chicxulub and uh, uh, Yucatan Peninsula seems to be the cause of that. But uh, the dinosaurs were suffering mightily already. They probably had a, a major volcanic winter going on just from the deck and traps. So life on Earth was already suffering. And the fi final event was the um, asteroid. Now, this suggests that we have an event coming up in a few tens of millions of years that might look more, more like what happened in Siberia. I state in this article that it will make the uh, Siberian, uh, the deck and traps look like a little firecracker. And this will happen in Africa, primarily in the area of South Africa. And it says you would not want to be in South Africa, maybe nowhere on earth. It's going to be that bad, guys. Maybe nowhere on earth. Subterranean tree. Um, is moving magma to Earth's surface. And so what they did is they went out uh, and did a, an example putting se seismometers all over the uh, Indian Ocean floor with robots, basically. They just they, they dropped these little probes that were like sinkable uh, submarines, but they were robots. But they went down and, and all they did was they were, they were seismometers. They put, planted this network of seismometers. And to show you what that map looks like, I'll skip on down here. See, they already had set seismometers on Madagascar and on land, and a couple out here in the sea, at least one there. And they planted all these in this experiment it's because they were really interested. They, they, they knew this hot spot, what caused the deck and trouts is now in this area here uh, under Reunion Island. And this is one of the more active volcanoes actually in the world. A lot, a lot of us don't know about that because it's outside the sphere of you know, what we keep up with in our day to day lives. But uh, this is one of the biggest uh, hot spots. And what they found is uh, there's a whole tree of, of uh, plume material moving from the core of the earth up. And let's see if we can find some quotes in here. I'm not going to go long into this, guys. But uh, this talks about how the nature of hot spots was discovered, how they uh, are separate from plate tectonics, that they stay in one spot, uh, and how. Uh, they verified that with helium, th uh, various forms of helium, like helium-3. Uh, they also went into talking about here how, um, which says that it comes from deep in the earth, how they've used these seismometers, how seismometers are actually a bit tricky, too, because uh, the, the, the sound waves slow down in the hot magma, but also there are minerals that cause sound waves to slow down, so they have to be able to, to look carefully, distinguish between the two, and uh, so, you know, the, the science is murky. Science, you know, some people tell you that science is exact, but, you know, scientific uh, theories get overthrown a lot uh, by new developments. So um, science is an ongoing, you know, thing, and it's murky, and it gets messy, and, you know, science progresses when the old scientists die off. That's what they've always told us, right? It's because they get stuff stuck in their head because science Scientists are human beings and they are subjects of their biases and prejudices, just like defending the company you work for or, you know, the, the project or, you know, the, the contracts you're getting money for. So, you know, there is prejudices built into the system a lot. I've mentioned that. So sometimes the scientists have their finger on the scale a little bit or their biases and prejudices show up through the things that they write and suppose. Okay, enough of that. Uh, so like I said, science is a bit murky, but science does give us, give us ways to measure and ascertain the world. We just got to be able to see it, you know, crystal clear as to what it really means that we're looking at. So what they're talking about here is that there, there, 
they've seen these plumes, they looked at them, and uh, they, they come from the, uh, most of them are coming from that hot area at the boundary of the core of the earth and the mantle, which covers about 30% of that interface. And they well up from that, like, you know, Hawaii is one of these hot spots. They think Yellowstone don't come from down that low, believe it or not, but Yellowstone is a hot spot, it's a plume. And they say it's the youngest one in this article. So this over here, by this way, this article, why is it's here in Wired, they take it from, this is a republishment. All right. Yeah, here it says it's not as simple as upwelling and a box of syrup <laughs> in a laboratory. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, some scientists suspect that the plumes from the African blob spent at least 120 million years tearing uh, the ancient continent of Guandana land into shards. That was the one before Pangaea. Uh, as the plumes rose uh, into the base, they heated and weakened it like uh, moles making hills that caused the land atop the plumes to dome upward and slide downhill. Oh, hello, La Palma. Hmm, hope that don't happen there. Uh, Australia was unzipped from uh, India and Antarctica, Madagascar from Africa, and the Shekels uh, mid-continent from India as an act of destruction that made the Indian Ocean. Hmm. So we're talking about uh, this plume leading to the uh, disintegration of the African continent, specifically the East Africa. We know there's a big rift in Africa right now, right going right through Kenya that was split uh, off uh, East Africa. So they're talking about that, but even more, it may break up even more according to this. Um, let's see, uh, the team estimates that in tens of millions of years, a blob of nightmarishly gargantuan proportions will pinch off from the central cusp and rise to meet what is now South Africa's foundations. Because they found this big blob beneath. And these blobs do rise. I mean, they're hotter than the rock around them, which means they rise faster. So they do rise. There is a rise rate. And that's what, how they come up with this uh, estimate of tens of millions of years. Uh, so they, they said this would produce catastrophic, or, cas or excuse me, cataclysmic eruptions. The deck and traps are caused by what we think of as a solitary mantle plume. This future mega blob would be capable of producing vo volcanism so prolific and extensive that the Deccan traps would look like a firecracker by comparison. So what they're saying here is this would be a really rough day uh, or a period. It could last for a long time too, guys. This could go on for millions of years. And yet uh, for all the chaos, uh, these mantle plumes we're talking about, they are part of the unceasing cycle of plate tectonics, or one that uh, radically buries and erupts carbon in water and has miraculously resulted in a habitable planet with a breathable atmosphere and expansive oceans, a paradise made by abysmal behemoths. So these things bring us life and death, according to this. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, it will be some time for the mammals. Monsters are thoroughly understood, indeed, to that. So uh, there's a lot to be learned here yet, but uh, what they're talking about here is highly concerning. Now let's see, there's another quote in here somewhere about this potential cataclysm. Let's see if I can find it, maybe up here at the very beginning of this article. That's the history. We don't wanna go through all the history of fountains of fire. All right, bear with me one minute. This is worth seeing. I'll find it. Try not to read the heart to you. I've seen, you know, I've heard a lot of uh, YouTubers uh, talking their talk, and you see them talking to the screen, but uh, I, I've gone back and found articles where they read word for word what was in the article. And I've seen other, also there's channels that use a robot talkers that often take an article and just reread it and show different graphics, you know, in the background while, while they're, they're re it, the robot talker is reading an article. So I try not to too much. I, I'll read excerpts from articles, but I think that's that's going over oh, a little bit over 
forward to read directly from an article that extensively word for word. Um, well, I'll just have to tell you what it is. Somewhere in this article, it, it says that it's talking about that particular potential future event tens of millions of years from now. And what it says is you would not want to be in South Africa or perhaps even on Earth when this happens. What does it mean? It would mean, let me stop the share. That would mean a super catastrophic nuclear winter uh, for a lot of the Earth, but uh, it would be, you know, Hades hot, you know, near the, near this area where you got a huge, huge land area that's just up well in magma. It'd be unbelievably hot in that area. And probably cause some crazy weather because that's going to cause the air to rise there and it's going to sink where it's colder and it would probably change the weather patterns on Earth somewhat. Um, not, well, that's probably an understatement. The coolant uh, the, would, would have huge effects. Um, it don't take that event to, 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 you know, these things also drive super volcanoes, which are less frequent than those events. We're talking here something's beyond a super volcano, way beyond a super volcano, very, very explosive for a long time. Like a whole continental area just becomes magma. Uh, not a whole continent, but a major section. Of, I think of a major section of India or a major section of Siberia. Uh, not the entire Siberia, but a major section of it. And we're talking something far bigger than Texas. Uh, that, that would just be an open spot of magma. You know, that, that, that and maybe for a long time. That, but that's just would be, you know, we don't know what that's like. We have no concept for that. That's beyond the super volcanoes we talk about in fear. So it's not something we would want to live with. We talk about super volcanoes as a doomsday event. It definitely would end civilizations. We know it because the nuclear winter, uh, the volcanic winter would be so intense. So we, fortunately, we don't have to face that probably today. It will probably be at least tens of millions of years before an event that large would happen. But in the meantime, there can be super volcanoes. I did an article talking about that, a uh, video talking about that, how they're actually more frequent than we thought. And, uh, you know, we're more than overdue for, for one of these things to pop off. And the crazy thing about that article was that the magma chamber don't even have to be filled with magma for it to go off. So what happens? Does a plume suddenly punch up from deep underneath and, and, and cause something to happen real fast? I don't know. You know, there is magma moving in uh, uh, Yellowstone. You know, we thought there wasn't enough in there to cause that explosion. This paper maybe puts it in a different light, but there is a lot of magma moving into Yellowstone. It's still not, you know, it's not like half magma. It's not like the chamber's full. So most of us are going, eh, nothing to worry about. Well, we don't know now. We just don't know. Uh, so this, these are things to keep your eyes wide open and head on swivel about. The super volcanoes are the ones that might guess, but it don't even take a super volcano to, to really change the climate. Look at uh, the explosion of Tambora back in uh, you know, 1816, it resulted in a year without a winter, I believe in 1817, might be a year, maybe, maybe a little year back, but anyway, the year without a, excuse me, a year without a summer. So that caused mass starvation in New England uh, and other areas. I mean, it was reported even here in Alabama, there was a frost in July and it wiped a lot of crops out. So that, that was a bad year for, for people on earth. And today with our, uh, with, with us, uh, the huge population we have and how much we consume the food supply, that would be catastrophic, especially all the other weather events going on. So, you know, it, you know that's all it would take, not even a super volcano to dramatically affect our lives. Uh, you couple that with everything else going on today, I don't know, guys, it's, we're, we're living in perilous times, perilous times. You know, I think the closest thing you could find describing these times could be found here. In the book of Revelations, um, uh, that that's a very descriptive book, and it, and it sounds a whole lot like the times we live in, in many ways. So you know, if you want to see the book of Revelations, go we'll outside and look around. Look at your newscast. Uh, I don't know, guys. So get right with your maker. Love your family. Love your friends. Try not to be the uh, source of hatred that doesn't buy anything. But you have to defend yourself and you have to defend your family. That's things that we like to take from us, right? Um, so just, just bear in mind, 
that we are in perilous times. I'd say get ready, prepare. And a, a volcanic winter, a nuclear winter could put us out of growing uh, for up to seven years, maybe 10. But they say mainly seven that would be the worst part. The first three would be worse. So, you know, if you have at least three years supply of food and know how to, and know how to, to, to forge wild stuff. But if, if, if you had a nuclear or a volcanic winter, the wild stuff's not going to be growing either. <laughs> they might still be living cambium in, in, in layers in the trees that you could harvest and eat the trees, literally. I've done videos about that, okay? Uh, but there's I got two that touch on that topic. Um, yeah, you need to store food as much as you can and seeds because you got to be able to plant on the other side of all this stuff. So save your seeds by all means. And, you know, buy seeds and have some in storage, especially if you're not growing enough to be saving a lot of seeds yet. You need enough seed to be able to plant about a tenth of an acre. Go back to see my video uh, we did with the Jason Avers back uh, a few weeks ago. Where we talk about how you lay out a, a plot that could feed a family. We're talking about well, you could literally feed a family of four on less than a tenth of an acre. But you need a little bit more than that because you also need to save food, guys, if you can. But, you know, so, uh, you know, a tenth of an acre is not that much, you know, it's a little over 4,000 square feet. Um, so, uh, but you can feed, you know, two people for half that, about the area the size of a home. Maybe if you don't have a place to grow, maybe you should just build a deck over the roof of your house and put containers up there <laughs> and grow stuff in a con big container garden. <laughs> Uh, but hey, if nothing else, grow some food in your windowsill. You may live in the city, grow in your windowsill. Uh, off your patio, deck, garage, uh, in your driveway. But guys, if you live in the city, I'd say, what are you doing there? Get out. Do anything you can to get out of the cities these days. They're not going to be a good place to be. I'm gone long, and it's 5 a.m. I need to take a nap before I start my next day. I'm going to, uh, this video will take a little bit to process and we got to upload it and then they got to chug on it with youtube for some time but guys I check out my patriot supply go to prepwithgreg.com to get there because you get the specials you've got to prepwithgreg.com and it helps me if you go straight to that website you don't save any money in it and it don't help me either <laughs> so go to prepwithgreg.com and also go to uh, True Leaf Market. I'm going to be, I'm, I've established some affiliate uh, marketing links, uh, another seed company and some other companies. So I'll be bringing that to you soon. Uh, but for now, go to True Leaf Market uh, and check the seeds out with them. Uh, I will say, you know, the True Leaf Market is absolutely a fantastic source for non-GMO heirloom seeds and other growing supplies. And you can get microgreen seeds and supplies to grow microgreens. You can have fresh greens year round. Greg, how do you, what do you do when, when the grid goes down? Well, you don't need a little bit of sunlight. You can put these things in your windowsill, basically. Uh, only about three days of sunlight to bring it up. Most of the time you grow them in the dark. And yeah, you just put, have your pot, you know, for the seed source plant. You know, if you don't grow amaranth, you know, get a few seeds and put some in the big pot and put it where you get more sunlight. And in and, and, and the best growing season, it may be inside your house too, and grow it out and make seeds. You know, you have potted plants in your house. To, you know, amaranth likes it warm anyway. Uh, that's the one. Uh, you know, you've got uh, broccoli and cauliflower and several other uh, things which are really good to grow for microgreens, kale, but you can plant a few for seeds. And these plants make a lot of seeds, especially amaranth. Wow, it makes tons of seeds. So that's how you can do it, guys. You don't need seeds to plant these things, but if you do right, you can, you can, you can propagate and start your own and repeat it. All right, guys. I've said about these things. Um, remember this. I always say that as light dispels dark, love dispels hate. Go out and shine your love light to the world. Let's try to make a difference. Let's be a positive source for change in this negative world, this, this uh, area that seems absolutely demonic right now. So be the, be the source of light and love. And, uh, and, and you know, but like I say, get right with your maker. And, and 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 with your family and and just tell everybody you love them every chance you get you never know when you get another chance you may never you just never know what life's got in store for you you know i've, I've seen some of my friends you know very young people just poof one day they're gone you just never know be from anything renal embolism car wreck 
we don't know what our allotted time is here. So just make the most of it while you can and be a, be a positive source for change. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.